Okay, so now I'm going to move on to introduce our guest speaker. So mm -hmm. Dennis Pilon is a professor of political science at York University and Canadian electoral reform expert. And really, I don't think there's anybody who's put in as much work, particularly on this aspect of the topic, which is the whole political history of electoral reform in Canada and in Western democracies than Dennis has. He has written dozens of journal articles, newspaper articles, book chapters. He's written two books, uh, Politics of Voting, Reforming Canada's Electoral System, and Wrestling with Democracy, Voting Systems as Politics in the 20th Century West. Professor Pilon has done considerable public speaking and media work, commenting on many aspects of politics with reporters from print, radio, TV, particularly topics relating to elections and political parties. He is presently a member of the National Advisory Board of Fair Vote Canada of the Editorial Board of Canadian Dimension Magazine. He has also acted as a consultant on elect election issues for various legal firms, political parties, trade unions, community groups, and the Auditor General of Canada. I got through that whole long biography, and you can see the whole extended biography on Dennis's site on, on, at York University. So with that, I will turn it over to Dennis to talk about how other countries change their voting systems. Great. Well, thanks, Anita. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, here in Toronto, we have a sunny uh, Sunday night. Uh, and so for you to take some time out to spend some time with us is uh, we, we certainly uh, honor that. Um, uh, what have I got? I, I, I was looking through the names that on the chat and wow, there's people from all across the country. Some of the names I recognize from their hard work on voting system reform efforts. And of course, a lot I don't. So so welcome. Uh, and I hope that there'll be some stuff in tonight's presentation that you find interesting uh, that you want to follow up on. As Anita said, uh, there's always more questions uh, than there is uh, time to deal with all of the questions. Um, uh, so I, uh, one thing I, after all of these talks, I have people uh, write to me. Uh, so just Google Dennis Pilon and you can find my email uh, and you can email me at, at York U. I'm happy to take any other questions that you may have or, or cl clarification, or if you want to straighten me out on some issue, I welcome all comers. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And all of my research is available for free on my Academia EDU site. So if you want to look at different aspects of the question that I don't cover tonight, you can find that again just by Googling Dennis Pilon, uh, and you can find all that for free. Well, look, here's the talk. I, I, I'm sharing my screen with you now, which uh, is my uh, PowerPoint presentation. And just let me know if the slides don't move. Sometimes, you know, there are issues on these things, but for the, for the most part, I think it should, it should work pretty well. So the topic tonight, how did other countries get proportional representation? This has got to be the big question on most people's minds, right? How, how did other people get it? Because, of course, you're here tonight because you want us to get it. Uh, and so I hope that I can shed some light on, on, on why this is a challenging question, uh, why it's a bit tricky. Uh, now, I can hear someone tapping away on their, on, their, on their keyboard. So I don't know if everybody's got their, uh, uh, their mute button on, but I just ask everybody if they could put their mute on while I'm doing the presentation. And then, uh, and then later on, we'll see what happens. All right. So I think the two themes that we want to take up tonight uh, in terms of answering this question, where do voting systems come from? Uh, and so I think we would divide this into, well, what have we been told in the past about, uh, or even now, or what are we hearing from different political actors about where voting systems come from, what, even what academics have to say? Um, and then what do we know from research? What does research tell us about this topic? Uh, and here are some of the things that we've typically been told about uh, where voting systems have come from. We've heard, and I, you know, I say this, we hear this from academics as much as from anyone else. Unfortunately, uh, we hear that voting systems are a product of culture. Uh, so one, one famous political scientist said that, uh, you know, Europe is a cooperative culture. That's why they have PR, uh, whereas America, Canada, and the Brits are adversarial uh, cultures. That's why they don't have PR. They like first past the post. And first thing I thought when I heard this was, hmm, there were those two world wars uh, that they had in Europe. So uh, maybe not quite as cooperative as people might have thought. Maybe there was some work that they had to do. Um, another thing we hear is that voting systems are functional to the workings of their societies. So uh, countries that have certain needs end up adopting voting systems almost in a, like an automatic relationship. You know, Canada is this big regional country. Ipso facto, it follows that we need these single member ridings dotted across the country, or at least this is the kind of uh, 
you know, post hoc explanation that we typically hear. Another thing we hear is that voting systems are the product of, of some consensus that happened sometime long ago. Nobody ever specifies exactly when or how it happened, but somehow in the past, there was a consensus that this is what we should do. Another approach says that it's a matter of choice. Different countries have chosen these systems, but again, uh, often no details on how they were chosen, who chose them, uh, who was included in the choosing, choosing making process, and, and of course, more importantly, who wasn't included uh, in the choosing. And then there is an approach that recognizes the conflict uh, has fueled the adoption of different system. In fact, there's one approach that sort of assumes conflict in all things. So they sort of say, well, you know, uh, political parties, political actors are self-interested. Uh, so not surprisingly, they choose systems that benefit them. I mean, at the level of, of, a, of a statement, it, it makes a case, but it's so vague and so broad that it's not very precise. It doesn't really give us any information about the precise conditions that contribute to those parties acting in that self-interested way. So um, there are a couple of things that we know from people who actually do research on the topic um, uh, in terms of testing these claims about the things that we typically hear about the origins of voting systems. And one of the things is that none of these claims that I've just rehearsed uh, has any research backing. Uh, the people who make those claims uh, do not provide uh, what we would call empirical evidence. Um, I'm just gonna move this here. Um, None of the previous claims address the how question. How were the systems introduced? They, they, they make claims, they, they, it seems to suggest there was some kind of process, but they leave out all the details about precisely how the systems were adopted. And so I would argue that when you're gonna do research, the first things you do is you address the who and the when questions. Who was making the change? Who was responsible? for uh, the reform uh, in question. And when did this reform take place? Uh, because of course, when we know those two things, then we can address the how question. Then we can start looking at the details of, well, how did the actors who acted, uh, when they acted, how did they do what they did? Um, and those details I think are really important for us to understand uh, if we want to uh, bring them to bear on our contemporary situation. Now, there we go, let me see if I'm, yeah, moving along here, I think, right? Um, now, I'm just going to be humble here and suggest that some of the answers can be found in my book. Uh, the who and the when questions is the main focus of my book, Wrestling with Democracy. Uh, and the book looks at 18 countries over 150 years. It looks at every single instance of national voting system reform across Western countries. Uh, and I, what I wanted to do with the book was really give people a kind of one-stop shopping uh, about the importance of the historical context. How did the moment in which the reform uh, influenced what was going on? How did the actors have to take into consideration the particular context they were in? That is what my book uh, tries to do with all of these different reforms. And with such a broad scope, with such a, a grand approach, you know, looking at so many countries, you really can start to see the patterns. You can start to establish what are the things that are similar uh, across these different countries? Because it is quite striking, and you'll see in these tables I've got in a moment, it is striking how the reforms tend to ripple across borders at the same time in different countries. And so why is that? Um, that's another thing that my book tried to grapple with. So how do voting systems get adopted? Um, I think that's the question. You're like, yeah, get to the point. Why? You know, what, 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 what are the answers? And the short answer, uh, as has been, of course, hinted at by our title for tonight's talk, multi-party cooperation and collaboration. That's the short answer for how voting, when we look at all the examples, when we look at all the instances, that is the thing that comes up again and again, is multi-party cooperation or collaboration. Not all parties, but more than one party, typically. Now, the long answer to the question is that multi-party cooperation is essential, informed by its unique historical context. So not all moments are the same. Not all eras of voting system are the same. There are some things that are similar, but there are other things that are different. And so we've got to grapple with the uniqueness of the moment uh, in terms of trying to understand, well, why do parties come to the table? Why do they think that they should do this? And of course, the challenge is then for now, taking these insights you know, in hand, 
is identifying the present unique historical conditions that may create the space for multi-party buy-in on this topic. Um, in a way, maybe uh, in any moment, there could be potentially an opportunity for voting system reform, but it is striking that we can see uh, uh, eras of voting system reform concentrated in particular historical moments. And so I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we approaching one? How would we know it if we saw it? Uh, what can we do to help foment it? How can we help to bring it about? What contribution could we make? That's where I think all of this different history uh, comes in handy. Now, in looking at the different eras, uh, I think we can break them up into three broad periods. And again, I'm, I'm mostly looking at Western industrialized countries, not because there's anything better or superior about those countries, but only because they share a similar uh, process of historical development around their institutions. Uh, it would be hard to compare what goes on in France or Germany or Canada with Libya. Uh, with uh, Iraq, uh, with Vietnam, with you know any any of these other countries who have have a very different uh, trajectory of political development. So, for the purposes of trying to figure out what is the same and what is different, we try to compare countries that are more similar in terms of their historical political development. So that's why we look at, at Western Europe and the Anglo-American democracies. Um, and I break it down into three periods, not because that's what I want, but, but that, that's where we see the concentration of the voting system reform efforts. So the early 20th century is a hotbed of voting system reform. That's when most Western countries switch to proportional representation. Then we've got another uh, group of reforms that occur in the mid 20th century, uh, right, at, right before and right after World War II. Uh, and then we've got three different moments of reform in the late 20th century, uh, one taking place in, in, the, in Southern Europe, then another in the post-communist uh, era, we're going to focus on uh, post-communist Central Europe, um, and then more recently in Western Europe and in the Anglo-American democracies. So these are our three historical contexts within which we can see this party cooperation taking place. And by looking at these contexts, hopefully we can draw out some of the reasons why the parties were cooperating the way they were at that time. So here's a table. It's not probably very easy to see. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a little smaller than I would have preferred, but I did want to get the whole thing on. Uh, if you want to have a chance to look at these tables a little bigger um, and in more detail and at your leisure, because I'm not going to give you enough time to read all these in detail uh, right now, then you can go to the Fair Vote uh, Canada site. Again, just Google Fair Vote Canada, and you, you, you know, you'll find this page fairly quickly. Um, and here you can study um, the years. And so we're going in order of adoptions. So if you start at the table at the top, uh, you know, snuck in Belgium uh, in 1899, um, which was the first to introduce a semi-proportional voting system. Um, and then we just move on from there. And so you can see how there's a few changes uh, in the first decade of the 20th century. But then, wow, things take off uh, during and after World War II. And we've got a huge clutch of countries that start to change their voting systems to proportional systems uh, just after, after World War I. And that is not accidental. Uh, that has everything to do with the moment that this was. And what you need to understand in this historical moment is that most of the countries on this list were not democratic before they adopted proportional representation. The adoption of proportional representation was a key part of transitioning, transitioning to a minimally democratic situation. I mean, not, not wildly democratic, but at least a system where most adults could vote and contribute to the election uh, of the representatives. Uh, the representatives who formed the executive, you know, the government, were accountable to the people who were elected. And so in that sense, we get at least a kind of minimally democratic uh, situation going on, certainly much better than what preceded it. And the adoption of PR was a key part of that process in most of these countries. So that context, that, that changing from not democracy to democracy was crucially important. And as I'll point out in a moment, the key factor influencing things was elite fear. The conventional elites of the society who had basically been running the show without democracy um, uh, 
uh, they were very worried about what including so many people in the decision making in the representation, what kind of impact that would have, particularly on property, on uh, wealth inequality, uh, those kinds of quest social questions. Um, and so they their move to PR was very much a, dis a defensive move. Uh, they were, you know, to, to sort of address these concerns. In other words, the old system was fine when people like themselves were going to be in charge. Uh, but hey, if the unwashed were going to be in charge, well, then we can't have, you know, we can't have that. Uh, and so they wanted some insurance uh, to sort of protect themselves, or, or so they thought at that time when they adopted it. The, uh, the next era, the mid 20th century, here you can see a few examples, well, actually only one Spain uh, adopting a, a semi-proportional system um, just, uh, just before the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and so, uh, and then the rest of the examples are, are, are from the post-war period. And what we have here are uh, interesting, and again, an interesting sort of moment of democracy where um, uh, the political right after the war were historically weak. Uh, because of course, in, on, on continental Europe, most of them had either worked with the fascists or were compromised by their cooperation with the occupying powers. So coming out of the World War, uh, they didn't have a lot of credibility. Um, and so they were very worried about what was going to happen. Meanwhile, while there was significant uh, public support for a lot of the things that left-wing parties were championing, uh, things like welfare states, you know, pensions, healthcare, the weekend, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, nowhere except Sweden uh, was the left in a position to uh, gain a majority government uh, in terms of the popular vote majority. And so again, we saw this sort of multi-party commitment to PR um, in part by some actors because they saw it as a democratic improvement, but for others, it was insurance. They wanted to make sure that they were protected in this new political environment uh, where they were unsure of what, what might happen. And of course, we see some, some interesting changes in the 50s, which I can address in the question and answer period where uh, there's some interesting sort of backsliding where different countries uh, uh, as their political rights, uh, the right wing start to gain their footing start to decide, well, maybe they don't want PR. And so we see some attempts to try to change it or limit it. Uh, some are successful, some aren't. Um, and so again, the, the democratic aspect of things is really important. As we move forward uh, into uh, the more modern period, the more recent period, recent, of course, in, in quotation marks, um, Southern Europe, uh, so in the 1970s, uh, various countries that had been under dictatorships in Western Europe uh, now return to minimally democratic rule, and interestingly, all, all support, all move towards a proportional voting system. Um, the post-communist era um, in Central Europe, again, all countries either adopt a semi or, or proportional systems, um, and then in, in Western Europe, uh, starting with France, uh, we see uh, various uh, efforts to change the voting system. Uh, this very much influenced by the changing political economy of the global world. Uh, you know, the, the rise of what we call neoliberalism uh, was contested uh, in these various countries. And in some countries, they wanted to move away from PR so that they could further advance neoliberal ideas. In other countries, they wanted to move to PR to resist uh, these neoliberal pressures. So we see in Italy uh, an attempt to remove PR because they want to further neoliberal uh, economic policies. And in countries like New Zealand, they move towards PR because they want to stop some of the neoliberal uh, economic things that are going on. So it's very interesting to see that the topic of PR, of voting systems, is never discussed in isolation. It's always discussed in concert with these social uh, inequalities, uh, social factors, how the economy is run, um, you know, who benefits, who wins from those sorts of things. So what are some of the themes that we might draw out from this mini history lesson I'm offering you? Uh, well, the first one is that battles over voting rules uh, are really battles over the scope of democracy. You know, there's a line of thinking that we hear from conventional political scientists that say, oh, voting systems are about values, they're about principles. Not really, not, not, in, not in real politic terms. Uh, I mean, they are for people like us, you know, for us, the values are very much at the forefront. We, you know, we're Democrats, you know, we want every vote to count. That is certainly a very value-based approach. 
But that's not the reason that countries have adopted the systems that they have, or at least not the main reason. There might be actors in the background pushing that approach. Um, but the battles over voting rules have always been about what is democracy going to be? Uh, who is democracy going to serve? Uh, or to put it differently, who is democracy going to hurt? Uh, and so we've seen this pitched battle often between left and right, um, where there are concerns on the political right that democracy is going to get out of hand, uh, that democracy is going to diminish the traditional privileges that are accorded to those with significant property. The early period, um, as I've mentioned, is defined by the move to minimal democracy from non-democracy. Uh, and as I've mentioned, the elite fear of democracy. Uh, in the mid 20th century, we were mostly looking at a restoration in countries that had lost their democracy uh, to sort of reimpose some of the some of the institutions that existed beforehand. But of course, this is going on in a very unique set of circumstances. As I mentioned, the political right is historically at its low point uh, because of their um, their cooperation with fascist powers during the war. Um, but also, the emerging Cold War is putting pressure on the West to live up to certain democratic ideas uh, that uh, the Cold War countries are saying that they are living up to. Now, we don't need to get into debate about whether those countries were actually doing it. Um, the point is that the fact they existed created pressure on the West to live up to their own claims of democracy. And so this was an opportunity to push more democratic voting systems. In the late 20th century, we see two trends. On the one hand, we see a return to minimal democracy where no one group dominates uh, the political scene. And what's not surprising in those circumstances is that when no one actor can be guaranteed to control things, then every actor has an interest in a proportional outcome. Uh, and so that's why we see not a single country emerging from uh, the Southern Europe restoration of democracy or the, the end of the, the Soviet bloc, not one of them adopts first past the post uh, as their system because no one in those countries is prepared to take the risk that they will come out on the short end of the democratic stick. Um, so that's, that's, that, 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 that is one side of it. But the other trend in the late 20th century uh, is um, opened up by basically a party system breakdown. Um, so in, in all the countries where we see the change in Japan, in Italy, in New Zealand, in France, what opened the door was the changing relationship between parties. Uh, and, that, um, and that was fueled by this economic uncertainty. What should countries do? Should countries move more along a neoliberal uh, direction? Should they move away from a neoliberal direction? And the concern there was the way in which neoliberal economics was removing uh, political decisions from the political realm and making them more economic questions, uh, which raised a lot of concerns for, for many people. So what are the patterns that we can see over time? Well, one of them is that the introduction of PR always requires multi-party cooperation and collaboration. Uh, not everybody, doesn't need everybody to sign on, but what we see again and again is that uh, uh, PR systems are introduced uh, through uh, multi-party cooperation and, and collaboration. Whereas the introduction of non-PR systems nearly always results from a single party imposition. A single party is in a position to basically impose their choice on everyone else. Um, the early period sees the right and center of the political spectrum calling for PR to stall the left. They're worried that the left is going to sweep this new uh, democratic space. However, the left in that period also supported PR basically as a matter of principle. Uh, so, um, so we see actually quite a bit of cooperation in bringing in those systems. In the mid 20th century, we see the right, center, and left call for PR amid a post war uncertainty. As I've mentioned, the right is weak and the left isn't strong enough to rule alone. Now, there are some exceptions here, and West Germany is a really interesting case where initially um, all parties are calling for PR. But as the Cold War uh, uh, breaks out, the right in Germany starts to change their position and starts to call for a first past the post system. But at that point, it's too late, dies already cast. And so they move on with their mixed member proportional system. 
By the late 20th century, the left and center call for PR to limit uh, neoliberal economics. And that was certainly the case in New Zealand, where a big part of the public campaign for proportional representation and why it became such a barn burner of a topic was the sense of betrayal that the public felt, that it didn't seem to matter who they voted for, they kept getting the same economic policies. Uh, and that just didn't seem right. Uh, and so they were able, through a series of accidents, uh, to, to get a voting system and also uh, a new voting system, and also uniquely by using a referendum. Uh, but the situation in New Zealand was so unique uh, and no one else has been able to use a referendum to get a new voting system. Italy used a referendum to get rid of a voting system, but not to get a new one. Uh, whereas, of course, uh, we've seen the right uh, call for an end to PR uh, to help entrench and move neoliberal economics forward in Italy and, and to an extent Japan are examples of, of that uh, situation. Well, where does this leave us? What is to be done? Uh, the introduction of proportional voting systems in Western countries is nearly always the product of multi-party agreement, not referendums or other processes. Uh, and so the call today for these other processes, uh, you know, some terrible, some quite laudable, uh, but at the end of the day, when we look at what is reliably uh, uh, going to get results, it's always been multi-party agreement. Uh, and again, not everyone. Uh, but certainly enough that they can legitimately claim to represent a majority of the people who are taking place in taking part in elections. The agreements that parties work out are worked out in unique historical conditions. Uh, and these historical conditions allow uh, the marriage of party self-interest with public interest. Uh, so it's interesting that when we go back to World War I, uh, it was pretty clear that the right wing and center parties weren't really that concerned about democracy. They were really worried about democracy. They didn't want democracy, um, but they saw PR as a way of limiting the impact of democracy. Funny, it ended up that they didn't need to worry quite as much as they thought they needed to. Uh, you know, this new voting constituency didn't simply side with left wing parties. And at the same time, PR actually turned out to be a more democratic system than the, the other systems. Um, so even though the authors were not Democrats, they ended up authoring a much more democratic system. And that's just one of the unpredictable things that happens uh, historically. The challenge for us now is to identify how to link the public interest in greater democracy with our existing state of the party system. These historical lessons are, are, are lessons and insights, but they cannot be read off as a how-to guide uh, to get what we want. What we see in looking at the different historical eras is that each era is different, uh, and each era has required a different marriage of party self-interest and public mobilization behind improving the democratic process. And I just caution that you have to remember that even as people uh, mobilize and fight for more democracy, we do face organized forces who are continually battling for less. Uh, and so the campaigns that we see to limit democracy are certainly alive. Uh, and those forces uh, aren't just standing still. I mean, even as undemocratic as our current system is, they are looking for even more ways to limit uh, its democratic potential. Uh, so we've kind of got a double fight on our hands, right? To advance a more, a more democratic set of institutions, um, but at the same time resist uh, the efforts by the less democratic forces to get their way. So that, I think, is the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you, Dennis. That was great. You covered uh, you know, over 100 years in uh, 20 minutes or something. <laughs> so really, I mean, uh, it's only scratching the surface, right? So I hope everybody was able to pick out some of the, the themes uh, that Dennis talked about, some of the things that might be helpful for us to understand. So we actually got a lot of good questions. Uh, thanks for everybody who's asking really relevant mm -hmm. and useful questions today. I really appreciate that. So I'm I'm not doing them in order. I'm just picking a, picking a few out. Uh, this one... Uh, Someone was saying, I'm just paraphrasing questions, folks. I'm not in there with the chat box trying to, I'm not good at that. Okay. So someone talked to somebody who's running for office who was opposed to proportional representation because they said, if PR comes in, it will collapse their party. I'm wondering if Dennis could uh, speak to the fears some parties have that 
uh, like we saw in 2018 when the BC Liberal Party, uh, one of their MPs said, if PR comes in, there will be no more BC Liberal Party. Hmm. It was that much of an existential threat. So I'd like you to address that. Well, I, I mean, I it's an interesting statement to make, uh, kind of an admission of some pretty serious problems. Uh, Look, you know, to me, the, the, the issue is simple. Um, democracy is about representation. And uh, it's ultimately up to the voters to decide, you know, what they what they want to vote for. Um, and then it's up to the politicians who get elected to work things out, right, to bring things together. Um, our current system creates incentives and disincentives uh, for certain actions. Uh, and so, yeah, we know that there are parties that have got a curious mix of people trying to work together. Uh, some people say that's great. They th they think that's fabulous that you know it forces people into these unlikely marriages. But on the other hand, it 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 keeps a lot of that debate out of the public limelight. So we don't actually know what's going on in these parties. We don't know what kind of promises were made uh, to different groups within that party. And um, the parties themselves are not often paragons of democracy. Uh, so people who are forced to work in those parties uh, don't find them always to be very welcoming places, very democratic spaces. Not everyone feels like they're being heard. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's the way to do it. I think that when we look at countries with proportional systems, um, you know, they have a good range of parties. Uh, people get choices not just between left and right, but within left and right. Uh, and I think that actually keeps those parties honest. So maybe our system is, um, you know, an unhappy marriage. It's it's holding forces together who would probably be more effective and happier working uh, in a in a different kind of situation. Maybe in a party that could speak clearly about what they believe, but then if they don't have enough support to do the things they believe, then they got to start working out some deals. Then they got to figure out how to work with other people. And I think everybody would benefit from that. I think the public debate would be better because we would hear a better range of views within the conservative party or between different conservative forces or on the left or even parties who don't fit neatly into left and right. I think we would all benefit from hearing those different voices, but then working out how to create uh, the policies that will have the support of the most people. Yeah. Okay, the second question I got, uh, it's a bit of a familiar question here. Somebody saying uh, they think PR is a good idea, but then they started getting worried that extremists would become mainstream. Well, I mean, you know, extremism is uh, one of the things that we often hear about when people talk about PR. And um, I mean, we've seen countries with PR um, uh, for over a hundred years. Uh, and yeah, some parties come up that other people don't like. People think that they are extreme. Um, it's it, This is a difficult thing because one person's extremism may not be someone else's extremism. Um, so, you know, we've got to keep that in mind. Um, but what we've seen in, if we're talking, for instance, you know, one of the topics that come out is right-wing populism, right? We've got a lot of these sort of right-wing populist parties and in Western Europe in the post-war period, yeah, they've come, they've shown up, but typically they haven't gotten very much done. Uh, most of the other parties typically wouldn't work with them. Uh, and so uh, after a few elections, they'd go away and their voters would vote for someone else because, you know, a lot of voters are actually pretty practical. They don't want to throw their vote away, which is, of course, why some of the parties in our current system get the support they do, even though people don't really like them as much as it looks like they do. Um, you know, they're kind of holding their nose because they don't want to waste their vote. And it's the same with these uh, extremist parties. Uh, sure, there might be people who say, I'm going to vote for this party for any number of reasons. But then if they don't get anything done, then they go and give their vote to someone else. On the other hand, if you've got a public moving in a certain direction, you no know, voting system is going to stop that from happening. Uh, and we can certainly see that today where, you know, Trump got elected under first past the post. Uh, his Republicans that are in the Senate and the Congress, the lower house, are elected under first past the post. Uh, and they're saying some pretty out there stuff. Um, and that's first past the post. So, I, you know, is it PR or is it the time we're living in that uh, we're seeing people come out with these ideas? But I'll tell you what the best protection against being uh, suffering under uh, a, a government that doesn't reflect what people want is PR. Uh, you know, if that's the way some people are going, then I don't want them to have any more uh, voting power in the legislature than they've got coming. I don't want to see them overrepresented because, 
uh, right now, if they're there, they've got to work to get other people to agree with them. And that's the best protection a democracy has. Okay, somebody else asked about uh, ranked choice voting. And would it be the same outcomes as PR, or different outcomes? And is it easier to adopt? Another familiar question. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, of course, we need to distinguish that, you know, ranked choice voting is not really a voting system. It's it's become popular to call what we used to call the alternative vote, or the Americans called instant runoff voting, that people call that ranked choice or ranked ballot. But in fact, you can rank in both majority and proportional systems. Remember, there's essentially four kinds of voting systems, right? Four families. You know, you've got first past the post, and that can be in single member or multi-member ridings. You've got majority voting systems like Australia or France, and that can be the alternative vote, ranked vote, ranked choice voting, uh, or uh, the double ballot. And then PR, we've got a bunch of different PR systems, right? And then you've got a couple of semi-proportional ones. In Fox, we put everything that doesn't fit. And so you can have a ranked ballot in a PR system, like the single transferable vote. That's the one they use in Ireland. That's the one they use for the Senate in Australia. But often what people mean is the Australian lower house system, the, the alternative vote. And so that's where you rank your choice in a single member riding and they, they eliminate people until one candidate has got a majority of the support. Um, so the questions were, would you get the same outcome as PR? No. Uh, no, you don't get proportional results. In fact, you get almost kind of concentrated plurality results. Uh, and it often it, it very it limits entry of new parties into the party system. Um, Australia is a good example of that, where the two main parties, Liberal and Labour, dominate the lower house. Uh, nobody can get a look in. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't do that job. Uh, and it doesn't do well on the other things that PR can be credited with, like, you know, creating space for diversity, you know, social diversity or ideological diversity. Um, so, no. Is it easier to get? No, not, ne not, not necessarily. Right. I mean, it, it's got to be in the interests of some political party uh, to want to do it. Uh, and typically the alternative vote has been introduced or majority voting has been introduced by major parties who are being uh, harassed by a significant minor party. Uh, and so they introduced the alternative vote as a way of kind of knocking them away, you know, get, getting them out of getting them out of the picture. So I don't think that that is a, is, a, is is where you want to go. Right. You've got to ask yourself what your values are. Do you want better representation? Do you want a majority government that really reflects a majority of the people? Do you want every vote to count? You're not going to get that with the majority voting systems. You're only going to get that with proportional voting systems. OK, um. A couple of people are asking because they know we're campaigning for a citizens assembly. Uh, so they're basically saying, well, if it's multi-party agreement is how you get it, then what's the role of a citizens assembly? Is there any point in us campaigning for a citizens assembly, basically? So can you talk about how those things can work together? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hope I didn't give a sense that, you know, this always occurs at the elite level. The reason why I was pointing to historical context is because I'm trying to underline the impact of social forces and social events. We get this idea that politicians exist in some sort of rarefied air separate from everyone else, somehow not accountable uh, you know, to any groups in society, but they are. Um, we're not happy with how they're doing it now, um, but they're not completely free to do whatever they want. And so in those different historical periods, what we saw was different social movements and groups making demands and what demands they were making were seen as very threatening uh, to enough groups to bring them to the table, uh, you know, to force those political actors to make some concessions. I think that we could have a very interesting marriage of uh, a citizens assembly with parties cooperating. Um, because the Citizens Assembly could be the way that the parties get out of the self-interest argument. Right now, every time a political party says they're going to do something on the voting system, even if they can defend it as being in the public interest, the dogs you know, in the media and, and uh, in the other parties leap on them, oh, it's self-interest, you're just doing this for yourself. Um, but if they were to say, you know what, we're going to leave the decision about which PR system uh, to this Citizens Assembly. We are going to let the Citizens Assembly uh, work out the details based on their values. Um, you know, what do they think would be the right way to do this? So it's, it's not us just rigging the game for us. 
we're going to let this other group uh, instruct us. Um, but we're going to make sure it happens. We are committed to this as a policy choice. It's the right democratic choice. It's, a, it's clearly more democratic than the other systems. So we're going to do it, but we're going to do it in this way that we, we are not going to be accused of just rigging the system in our favor. And I think that could be a really fruitful uh, combination of those two ideas. Yeah. I just want to add a little bit to what Dennis is saying too, because he's, a lot of people when they hear citizens assembly, they have this idea like that we're going to get one and then the politicians are just going to agree to implement whatever it is sight unseen. And I don't think that's at all realistic. I see a citizens assembly as feeding into the multi-party conversation. We are trying to get them to the table. Right now, whenever they get to the table, they won't talk to each other. So we've had three all party committees at the federal level and they sit there and they look at each other. And like Dennis was saying, they can't, the turkeys can't design the Thanksgiving dinner. Apparently they can't plan what's on the menu all by themselves. They need a little bit of help. So this is a way, you know, to build credibility, to build a nonpartisan, make the movement stronger, a nonpartisan recommendation. But in the end of the day, parties are going to have to agree to a change. And it may not be exactly what the Citizens Assembly recommended, but it may take into account what the Citizens Assembly recommended. So we sort of, after 100 years, I think a little realism has, has kind of creeped in here. It's part of a process. We're part of a process right now and we're gaining some traction with this. And so this is the door that we're we're hammering on. So that Think makes about how we design our, our our boundaries and under the current system. You know, the Americans yeah. let the politicians who win have all the power uh, to make the choices. It's terrible. They've got terrible, terrible writings down there. Um, but yeah. we have what are called independent boundary commissions. And they uh, have judges and retired professors and different people, you know, citizens, uh, and they hear from citizens and political parties, and then they make recommendations. And it goes back to the parliament, and the parliament can talk, and they can argue, and they can disagree, and usually they come up with some kind of agreement to act. So that, to me, seems to be very similar to what we're proposing with this idea of using the Citizens' Assembly with an agreement by these political parties. So somebody wrote in a question uh, ahead of time. Okay, so they said, uh, I would like Professor Pilon to comment on whether implementation of PR at the local level improves the odds that it can be adopted nationally. This is something of an article of faith among the activists in the US. What is the evidence for it? Uh, the evidence is zero, oh. zero, that uh, we've got a lot of evidence that it is not a stepping stone. If you want PR for local election, that's great. I, I think it would be a dramatic improvement. Uh, here in Toronto, if we could r restore uh, the representation that was taken by the Conservatives away um, and, and then turn that into multi-member ridings, uh, we could have fantastic representation that really does justice to the diversity of views that are here in Toronto. Um, but don't think that it's going to be a stepping stone or some sort of demonstration effect, because we've got 100 years of evidence that that doesn't take place. You know, we, we had 29 municipalities adopt uh, proportional representation in Canada uh, around uh, World War I and in the years after, and not one of them led to an adoption anywhere else. Uh, in fact, we had an adoption of a semi-proportional system in two provinces, uh, in um, in uh, Alberta and Manitoba, but they were it had nothing to do with the municipal examples. So, no, it's not a stepping stone, and the Americans should know that from their own experience, where they had 50-plus municipalities adopt PR, um, and only one still uses PR, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So uh, they've had no success in, in scaling up from a municipal level. And I think we can pretty much say the same for the alternative vote. It's not a stepping stone to proportional representation either. Um, someone says, does a change in our voting system require a change to our constitution? This question, uh, okay, so the short answer is no. Uh, no, it does not. Uh, Parliament has the power to change the voting system. Uh, you know, if we go back to the original BNA Act, it was fairly clearly stated uh, in the BNA Act that uh, you know these writings will hold until such time as Parliament decides that it wants to do something else. Um, now, some people try to say that well, it is constitutional because in a way everything's constitutional, right? You know, Canada has this weird constitution that is a mixture of statutes and uh, 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 
uh, written, you know, the BNA Act and, uh, you know, things that are just conventions. This is all part of our constitution. Uh, and so in that sense, sure, everything's constitutional. But if by constitutional, you mean, will it need this, the, the major amending formula where two thirds of provinces, you know, representing X number of, pop, of the population? No, it doesn't require that. All it requires is for parliament to pass the law. And we've got 10 examples at the provincial level uh, where provinces have simply introduced new voting systems by, by virtue of a vote in their legislatures. Okay. Um, so somebody is asking, okay, so if we need multi-party agreement, obviously it's going to need the agreement of one of our major parties, the Liberals or the Conservatives. Uh, what suggestions do you have in terms of helping them see that it's in their own self-interest? Well, I mean, you know, this is, again, one of the questions that I think Fair Vote has wrestled with. And, you know, all those people who have worked so hard within the Liberal Party uh, to, uh, you know, raise the issue, you know, kudos to you. That's hard work. It's not easy to go to those meetings and, you know, continually raise the issue. And you, you've done an amazing job. Um, but then it gets to the elite level. And, you know, of course, we've seen what what has happened. Right. We've seen uh, with, um, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau's promise. Uh, and all the work that the committee did in, in the House of Commons, and then it just, they just washed their hands of it. Um, so one thing we do know from studying uh, voting system reform comparatively is that um, voting system reform tends to follow an increase in the size of the party system. You know, a lot of people get that backwards. They say, oh, if you adopt PR, you'll have all these new parties. Nah, the PR is a reaction to an increase in the number of parties, and it's because the major parties feel threatened by the rise of these new parties. And we've heard more discussion of PR in this country since we have moved from a three-party system, a four-party system, to a five-party system. So the longer answer to your question is, um, if, you, if, if we want to move our major parties uh, to take up this issue, we need to continue uh, to advance the multi-party situation. Uh, you know, if we move to six parties, you know, if the conservatives were faced, I'm not telling people to go out and vote for, you know, a different conservative party, but I am saying that the, the comparative and historical record suggests that the thing that brings major parties to the table is when it's fairly clear they're not going to get all the marbles themselves. They're not going to be able to get it all. And what we've seen over the last 20 years is a significant decline in the voting power of both the liberals and the conservatives. They represent now the smallest uh, uh, group of voters uh, that they ever have. Um, I'm discounting the period where the conservatives split into two parties. But if we just take it when the two major parties were going, um, they've never been weaker than they are now. They've never had to share their voters so much as they, as they do now. Um, and yeah, they're talking more and are prepared to entertain discussion about voting system reform under these conditions. So it's absolutely crucial that people do not succumb to the strategic voting argument because that they are real politic organizations. They, they are about power. And it's only the loss of power, uh, the future loss of power, not just temporary, but like you're never getting back that power that is going to convince them that something else needs to be done. Okay, somebody, there's a couple of questions here about referendums. Um, I'm going to try to put them together here. So somebody's saying you've shown that only two of the 18 changes to the electoral system were made by a referendum. And he must be referring to the long list of most parties or most countries don't do this by referendum. And almost all the others by collaboration between several parties. What are the reasons, in your opinion, for rejecting a referendum process? And somebody else is asking a similar question that we get a lot, um, which sort of boils down to, um, is it because that all the referendums can, were too complicated? The system was just too complicated for people, and if we could just get it simple enough, there you go. <laughs> Well, you know, I guess it depends on how you come at this question. And I go into this in more detail in a recent paper I put together uh, called Myths, Damn Myths uh, and, uh, and Voting System uh, Change, uh, you know, how Canadian political scientists get democratic reform wrong. Uh, and so I sort of show how the logic that they use to defend uh, their view of voting system reform just doesn't, doesn't survive any kind of comparative empirical scrutiny. Um, we have to remember that referendums are an instrument, a fairly blunt one, um, and they don't register intensity of feeling. Uh, you know, it's just an on-off switch, you know, for the referendum questions. And 
Referendums can be used for any number of purposes. They're not even necessarily democratic. Uh, in the United States, referendums were continually used in the South to strip blacks of their voting rights. Uh, hey, that was defended as majority rules. Uh, the minority didn't have the power. Um, my view is that you work out how, how you need your institutions to work. What, what job does the institution need to do? And then you don't hold a popularity contest about which one you prefer. You use the one that actually does the job that you need it to do. And so that's where I think that these different processes are better than referendums. As was mentioned by one of the questions, yeah, we've got two examples looking at Western countries, Switzerland in, in 1918, and then recently New Zealand. And yeah, it's just not the way that you know countries have, have made these decisions. Now, often they've made the decisions not in ways that we would approve of, uh, but I think that we can improve those processes and bring more public influence to bear rather than this sort of, you know, uh, all or nothing, you know, sudden death approach with a referendum. I mean, a referendum is basically saying, do you prefer to continue to use a voting system that violates the democratic rights of most people? Seems like a weird question to me for a democracy to be asking. I mean, if we're a democracy, surely we should have some values that establish how we're going to operate as a democracy. And I think that means that all votes should count. All votes should count equally. Majority governments should actually represent a majority. That's how they should have their legitimacy. Um, we get into these discussions, they, they seem kind of silly, but political scientists don't look at the question historically. They tend to just look at it in this sort of like, hey, what's happening today? The facts are that we have come out of non-democratic situations but we have not necessarily changed the institutions. And that has privileged certain actors and not others. Canada is a good example where, you know, we start the country in 1867, come on, we're nowhere near a democracy, right? I mean, most people can't vote. Um, a small group of property holders are making all the decisions. And then incrementally different groups are invited to the table, but at no point do the invitees say, hey, and you know, should we fix up these institutions? No. They just keep using the same ones, and which coincidentally benefit them. Okay, somebody else wants to know, uh, why are the liberals so stuck on ranked ballot and so opposed to proportional representation? Well, I think most of you can probably figure this out for yourself. I mean, the, the liberals as the center party benefit from vote transfers from all over the political spectrum, right? They get, you know, they get voters who switch from the New Democrats, from the Greens, from the Conservatives, uh, I mean, maybe not as much the PPC, but, you know, they, they benefit uh, in a way that, you know, other parties do not. And so, uh, and of course, they've been the historic beneficiaries of our system. They've been in power longer than any other party. Um, and they're great at promising change, but not delivering it. Once they get into power and they have all the power, then they, they continue to use it. There are deeper reasons. I mean, it has to do with the structure of the Liberal Party, that historically it wasn't a terribly democratic party. Um, and it, uh, it was funded by the same groups that fund the Conservatives. Uh, so throughout our history, we had two parties, both serving Bay Street. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, they had a certain kind of veto over the sorts of things that government would do. And if you want to really read a fascinating account of the money behind the Liberal Party, you should go back to a great book by Reg Whitaker called The Government Party, uh, where he sort of sets out, looking at their historic records, uh, the ways in which these different actors uh, influence the decisions that different prime ministers, liberal prime ministers made. So that's the short answer, right? The short answer is that the liberals see the alternative vote as a way to channel uh, all votes back to them. And that's what we see occurs in Australia. In Australia, uh, green voters, their votes tend to get channeled back to the Labour Party. Um, you know, various populist right wing parties, they get channeled to the Liberal Party, which is the right wing party there. And so the Liberals, not surprisingly, see that they would benefit the same way with the alternative vote. Um, is that in the interest of the Liberal Party? Yes, it is. Is it in the interest of Canadians? No, it's not. Yeah, it's sort of a little bit like an illusion of more choice. But the actual outcome, I mean, I think for me, just seeing that they've had one minority government in Australia in the past 100 years with the alternative vote. So if you like a system that basically boils it down to two, two blocks and just gives one of them all the power all the time, that's a great system. But if we're actually looking to progress, it's not in the right direction. I just wanted to comment, too, on this thing about why does the Liberal Party, are they so hooked on the ranked ballot? Yeah, there's all those things 
but I just want to underscore that not all of them are. It's like Dennis is talking about at the when you get to the top of the party that the whole thing gets shut down, right? But when you're talking to backbenchers, the party is really quite divided. And there are a lot of the MPs who are good people who would get into this for the right reasons. And they are actually quite open minded. And that's helped us with our campaign for a citizens assembly, bringing everybody together for a process. So that means process for the people that like the ranked ballot, a process for the ones that like PR, a process to the, for the ones that just like processes. Like, let's bring <laughs> the liberals like processes. Let's bring them all in and so that we can advance this conversation because the whole party isn't necessarily the enemy. We have a lot of allies there too. Um, okay, let me see. Somebody was asking about the role of local MPs in a proportional system, will you still have representatives connected to a local area? Yes, you can. Uh, there's lots of uh, systems that have local representation. Uh, you know, the Irish system, uh, single transferable vote, uh, they're multi-member ridings. But it's interesting to talk to the experts there and, and the politicians because they often complain about how they just run off their feet by the public. Uh, and partly that's because the public has so much influence on them. Uh, under the STV system, the voters decide who are the individual candidates from the parties that get elected. Uh, so it really reduces somewhat the power of the parties to just parachute candidates in and say, well, this is who you get. Uh, and so the, you, you know, that is one way that you can do it. Obviously, the mixed member proportional systems combine a party list with local ridings look just like ours, maybe larger. Um, and uh, so that's another way in which you can have local representation. What's interesting about the local representation arguments is that there's a lot of focus on them, but not a lot of focus on what they actually do. Uh, and so, again, I take this up in my recent paper, Myths, Damn Myths, uh, available you know, on my website. Um, and it, uh, it, it sort of goes into, well, you know, how many people are voting for a local person? Almost nobody, right? Everybody votes using the party label as their indicator. And that's, this sort of brings us back to the referendum question, right? That, you know, voters are busy. They've got lives. I mean, sure, all of us here are really keen on this. And, and you, you're, you're showing that because you're here tonight. Um, but most people aren't here. And that's because they're busy. Uh, and so they use what we call in the trade information shortcuts. And those information shortcuts are things like party labels. You know, when you look at voter turnout at the local level, it's lower because there are no parties there. It's harder for voters to figure out what's going on. What do these people stand for? You know, or what, do they believe what I believe? And so the, the party label is the most significant piece of information that most voters are using. Again, you know, leave yourselves out because I get a sense you're, you're a different group of political animals here. Uh, you're probably more informed and more focused on politics than most people. You've got to think about most people, and they deserve to be able to participate too, um, with whatever they can bring to the table. And so, uh, you know, the, the local issue is played up a lot by the conventional powers who mostly are just trying to protect, you know, their bailiwicks, right? Trying to protect their control. The switch to a PR system would dramatically alter the power balance vis-a-vis -vis voters and parties with no party able to control everything. And, you know, we're assuming that Canadians won't vote 60% for one party. They have never done it really before, except in Alberta. Um, then, that gives parties a degree of, of, of leverage, uh, or that gives voters a degree of leverage over parties that they tend to lack now. And a lot of people look for that in their local representation. They think that their local rep is somehow going to be this champion. Um, sure, I mean, you can go to your local rep. They can help you with some problems you're having with government bureaucracy. But, you know, in Sweden, they don't have local reps, but they have a much better functioning bureaucracy. Uh, and it's partly because the party system is more responsive. And so the party system actually makes the services work better. Whereas in our system, we run this kind of two-bit system, um, and then everybody has to go to their local MP to try to get some help. Uh, doesn't seem to be the most uh, effective way. Meanwhile, for a lot of the things that people are voting for, which are the ideological reasons that distinguish left and right, well, if your local member doesn't agree with you on those things, they're not going to do anything for you. They can't, not, not, not in the system that we have. Okay, so somebody's asking, there's sort of two related but contradictory questions. Somebody's saying that our focus be on convincing the conservatives, and then the other person is asking, why are the conservatives so opposed? Do you want to comment on the conservative party and 
or possible role in Canada and democratic reform? Well, I mean, we shouldn't shut the door on anybody who wants to be a part of the party. Uh, you know, anybody who wants to get in on this voting system reform action, we should say, yeah, come on in. Um, and, you know, we do have some high profile conservatives, Hugh Siegel uh, and, and uh, you know, it's been others who, who've come along. Um, you know, most recently, the the previous uh, uh, conservative leader has come out and said the federal leader has said, oh, maybe PR is not a bad idea. Of course, he's on the way out the door. Uh, so, no, the problem is that um, we can find a few stray conservatives, uh, you know, who'll show up. Uh, we tend to hear from them when they're having internal issues, uh, when the party is split. Uh, when they're having difficulty getting along internally, that's when we start to hear some of them talk about PR. And frankly, I think PR would help the political right uh, work through some of their issues. I think that a PR system would allow more urban conservatives to have an influence on the party. Right now, they tend to be shut out of places like Toronto and downtown Vancouver. Um, but, you know, there's conservatives there. And do they bring a different view of conservatism? Yes, they do. And if they could bring their weight to bear... And at the same time, I think that if other parties like the liberals uh, were able to scoop up some of the support they have in Alberta, yeah, that'd probably make them a better Alberta Liberal Party, right? It'd probably make them more attuned to the things that distinguish uh, those uh, uh, Alberta Liberal supporters from other Liberal supporters. So, um, so no, I think there's, there's, uh, there's room to make the case. But at some point, we do have to cut our losses. And I do think that, you know, if we're looking for where we're going to invest our energy, uh, we continue to see conservatives at the forefront of some of the most undemocratic uh, uh, things that are going on. You know, the, the moves that um, the Ford government in here in Ontario has taken, uh, reducing the size of Toronto City Council by half during an election. I mean, you know, these are terrible attacks on democracy. Uh, and so we have to name that too, uh, in terms of trying to figure out how to move this forward. I would just say to people that the next thing you're gonna get from Faribault Canada in your inbox is an invitation to visit your conservative MP. <laughs> so this is not the easiest thing to do and it's not something that Faribault often sends people out for be just because it's in such a, hitting a, your head on a brick wall kind of a scenario. However, we're now eight years or whatever it is into a liberal government and there are some frustrated conservatives out there. You know, what, three, four leaders in, they've won the popular vote, but lost the seat count a couple of times now. And they could now be facing, even with being 10 points out in the polls, they could be facing a situation where there's another quote unquote liberal NDP coalition, you know, it's just kind of, Put them over the edge really um some of them are more open-minded than they have been and the fact that aaron i don't it's not a coincidence that aaron o'toole on his way out the door decided to tell the cbc to tell the rest of the party that now maybe is a chance to look at the fact that we could be more than one party there could be a range of choices for people and that maybe the conservatives would do better under a model like that and he's trying to get people thinking about it and it's time for us to kind of help our individual backbench MPs start to think about those possibilities too and buy into a process we need those votes to win we need those votes to win the citizens assembly motion so we're going to give it our best shot and we're going to need everybody on this call who has a conservative MP to go out there and help and uh and take that time to do that as as difficult as it is um somebody asked is there a way of in, of getting incremental change transitional change is there something that would be like a step towards pr that we could aim for uh you know a lot of people look to things like uh civil society organizations you know civil society organizations that adopt uh proportional voting for their internal voting uh historically that was very important in alberta the alberta grain growers were a grassroots organization of farmers in the in the pre world war 1 era uh and they championed uh the single transferable vote form of pr they used it in their own organization and so that clearly had an impact on the choices that the two farmer governments had um made uh, in Alberta and Manitoba. So there's no question that, uh, you know, that kind of demonstration effect uh, can get past some of the arguments, you know, the, some of the sillier arguments that people make about, oh, it's too confusing and, you know, gridlock and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's no sneaking past power. 
Well, you think you're just going to just slip it in? They're not going to notice? Like, oh, just we're going to put a little proportional representation in here and you look away. It's not going to happen, right? There's a reason this battle is hard. It's a, the, the, the voting systems are arguably one of the most important pieces of the democratic architecture because they are literally the aperture through which democratic demands flow. And not surprisingly, those that want to control that in their own self-interest want to keep that aperture as small as possible so that only the most powerful can get through. So that's what we're, we're up against. It's hard because we're up against the most powerful forces in Canadian society. And, you know, spoiler alert, they're not all Democrats. Uh, in fact, a lot of them aren't very democratic at all. Uh, so we've got to leverage uh, public power, legitimacy, constantly calling out these ridiculous results that any fair-minded person would say, how is this democracy? Um, and, and, and wait for the break. Uh, if anything, histor history shows us is that it's hard to see when the break is coming. It's hard to know, oh, this is it. This is the time that we can push our issue forward. Uh, so we're doing the prep work uh, tonight, right? This is what it is. You know, we're sitting here with you and we're saying, well, look, get ready because we're going to keep pushing and keep pushing and, uh, and, and wait for that opening. Yeah. And that's just, I mean, I think every single change or opportunity that we've had in Canada, none of the pundits saw it coming. The pundits will always say it's never coming because it's not happening right now and they can't see basically past a month down the road. So as a campaign, we make things happen. So, I mean, if, if anybody had predicted that the Liberal Party of Canada would have just adopted as their official party policy to have a National Citizens Assembly on electoral reform, but name me one pundit that would have predicted that ever happened. That was voting reformers working yeah. in that party, Liberals, that made that happen. So that's how these things happen. So if anybody says, well, you're not going to win that vote, well, maybe not. Maybe we will. You know, it's going to depend a lot on us. So in relation to what you were just saying, Dennis, uh, somebody says, this is an interesting comment. It seems to me that if you don't have a public which understands PR and its variants, there is little chance of a multi-party approach being influenced by a citizen's assembly. How can the public be educated on PR? Right. Well, you know, we've gone through this thing many times over the last uh, 25 years of, of voting system reform. And I mean, I've been working on this topic now for, oh gosh, uh, 30 years, more than 30 years. Uh, and I've heard every kind of argument you can imagine. Um, and let's get one thing clear. The public are not going to become voting system experts. Uh, they are not going to get into the minutia. Most people have no opinion on any voting systems, including our own. Uh, most people understand nothing about voting systems, including our own. OK, so that's that's a reality and that's not going to change. What can change is that people can understand the point. Right. What is the point of the thing that we're raising? Why should we why should they care uh, that it's important? They don't need to know the minutia to understand what a proportional system would give them, uh, what it could deliver. You know, around the world, average folks, many with very little education, use complex proportional voting systems and don't make any mistakes, right? The, the, the ballot spoilage in countries like Ireland, minimal, less than us, right? So that means that people understand how to use the system. They, they understand how to use the system to get the results that they want. That's the message that we have to get across. You don't need to go into all the details. In fact, that's a disaster. Don't do that, right? What you need to do is start with the conclusion what are people going to get? What's, what, what's, what's the promise of the reform? And the promise is that every vote will contribute to the election of someone that that voter wants. I mean, you know, as long as they're not voting for the monster raving loony party, you know, it'll make a difference, right? The representatives will reflect what people voted. And the government will need a real majority to do its work, which means that the policies will be broadly supportive and popular because they'll need that kind of support to get past. Those are pretty good promises. I think if you go to people with those promises, people will say, that sounds okay. I, I can't see any reason not to want that. That sounds pretty good. Um, you know, most people are not ideologues. Um, so, but you know, the minutia of the systems, definitely not. They don't, they don't need it. They don't care. If they do care, there are books that get into that that we can refer them to. Right. I mean, I think I would point to the Liberals 2015 promise when the Liberals, the NDP and the Greens all promised to ditch first past the post 
and people were, I think if they had thought together and made one of these multi-party compromises, public would have been with them. You know, it's political leadership that would carry, would have carried people more so than understanding the exact details of whatever was compromised on. So I have two more quick questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, so one is somebody wants to know the effect of PR on underrepresented groups, uh, LGBTQ2+, people homeless, immigrants, those with disability, just basically asking about the impact on people in society that are marginalized. I'll start with that. Uh, it's a very good question. We know from studying diverse representation that PR systems are more competitive. And that is crucial because what can happen in a competitive political system is that someone can lead on a topic and they can gain support for doing so. And it can create what we call a contagion effect. And that's what happened with gender representation. With gender representation, typically left-wing parties in Western Europe um, came under pressure from the women's movement. They mobilized. They said, what the hell? Why aren't there more women elected? And they got involved with the left-wing parties and they forced the left-wing parties to put more women candidates on the ballot and up went their numbers. But not just the numbers for left-wing parties, because as the other parties saw that left-wing parties were making hay with the issue, then they rushed to, to match what they were doing with their own female candidates. And we have seen this occur, not just for gender. It most recently happened in a, in a, in a, in a, a really exciting way in New Zealand, where their uh, introduction of a PR system led to a dramatic increase in Maori representation in the local indigenous people. They went from being dramatically underrepresented to actually being slightly proportionally overrepresented. They went from having only one party represent their interest to having representatives in all of the parties that were elected. This is phenomenal and such an, an excellent example of the contagion effect. Now, it's not impossible to make progress on diverse representation using first past the post. It's just that it's slower. It's slow. So we have crept up slowly, um, uh, but you know, it looks like PR systems adapt much more quickly and much more evenly. You know, for instance, I mean, for indigenous representation in Canada, typically we only see indigenous people elected in the north in areas where they have a significant concentrated population. But the majority of indigenous people in Canada live in urban areas and their, their influence is washed out. But under a PR system, they could have that influence even living in urban areas. So there's lots of promise there. Some of the other groups are more challenging and no system does a good job of representing the homeless uh, or the economically marginalized because being involved in politics takes time and money. And those are the two things that those groups don't have. Um, and so I think typically left-wing parties do a slightly better job of outreach to those groups, um, but it's very hard to represent that group because they are so economically marginalized. Okay, and the last one um, is a little bit of a question we don't get very much, but uh, Stephen, Stephen is asking, saying, you know, we often talk about Western democracies, obviously, because they're so comparable to us, right? But in his work, you know, as a volunteer in Toronto, there's people from all over the world. And he's wondering, are there any good examples of PR countries that you can talk about that aren't typical, like all white countries? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, a, again, a, a very fair question. And of course, we can. Uh, it complicates things. Remember, we are not just having an internal conversation, right? We are trying to convince others, you know, to join our campaign, uh, and not all of them, or we're trying to refute claims that are made uh, by groups that have a self-interest in defending the current system. And so we make the choice to use countries that are comparable to Canada, because that offers us the strongest association, right? We can say, well, look, when we look at the variables, we because the first thing that they try to do is say, well, that's not they're not comparable. They're too different than we are. Uh, and so you can't compare Sweden to Canada. They're too different from us. You know, those Swedes. Um, well, you know, we can show by various measures that they are in some ways very similar to us in terms of their economic development, in terms of their political development. So that's why we do it. But sure, we can learn from everywhere and we can look at these other countries. Um, and we can examine the conditions that have led to the adoption or introduction of different systems. I mean, there's been a lot of work on, for instance, on Fiji. Uh, Fiji is a multi-ethnic state. Uh, and so they have seen uh, you know, consistent instability uh, in the society. 
um, where uh, you know the the military takes power, then the military cedes power, then the military takes power again. Um, no, I, I think there's important things that we could learn from that process. But the challenge in some of those countries is that the problems that they face are problems that no voting system alone is going to solve. You know, some of the problems that they face are rooted in colonialism, you know, in imperialism, in the kind of economic depredations that they have suffered um, and still suffer, and then how that has affected their internal political development. So it, it makes it more complicated. That's why, you know, that's why we tend to stick with the Western industrialized countries. Okay. All right. I think that we've gone through almost an hour and a half, and we answered a ton of questions. Dennis, did you see any other that you just felt like I actually I have to answer this question? <laughs> yeah, I want to I want to double back. Uh, I saw a comment just briefly. I'm not able to read them very carefully, but I did see yeah, one object on the protest voting, uh, arguing that that um, that spoiled ballots are protest votes. And of course, they're correct that in some circumstances that is the case, but not always. Uh, and so in countries like Italy, spoiled ballots are definitely an organized, understood thing. And in places like Brazil, uh, a number of Latin American countries, it is a strategy. Uh, it's often used in quasi dictatorships to uh, object to what's going on without actually objecting. Um, but in other cases, spoiled ballots are just spoiled ballots. They're people who are confused about how to mark their ballot. Uh, and so that's why we 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 use them as a way of trying to assess how difficult the voting system is. The fact that so many people can mark their ballot with tiny levels of of spoiled ballots tells us something. It tells us that the system is not too hard to use, which is, of course, the claim about why we shouldn't make the change. It'll be too, too confusing. Um, look, what I see are a whole lot of questions, and obviously we didn't get a chance to address all of them, and I'm sorry about that. But I am excited that you have so many questions. This is fabulous. This is like the world's best seminar, right, for a professor. It's like, look at how excited and interested all these people are. I wish I could spend a lot more hours with you all uh, and be able to work through all the questions that you, you have. This is fantastic. Uh, definitely a good sign for our movement. Um, but I just want to say again, yeah. if you want to follow up with me with any of the questions or concerns, I'm happy to to uh, have a go forth, back and forth with you on email. Uh, you know, the important thing is I want you to feel confident going forward. You know, you can do this. This topic is 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 insanely technical and difficult, but it that's not the part that you need to know. Right? You can if you want, uh, but, but the essential things are not hard to grasp. And you can grasp them. You can get yourself, you know, ready. Uh, you can read the the stuff, and you'll be ready to go out and argue you know, your side uh, and and try to gain supporters. I think you know we've got the we've got the materials to help you with that. So let me help you find what works for you uh, moving forward.